we can start. Welcome to today's online event on eTeaching.org. My name is um, Philip Meyer, and as the moderator today, I'd like to say hello to everyone who has already signed in. And of course, a big hello to our guest and speaker today, Mr. Stephen Downs, who I'm going to introduce in a few moments. So today's um, event is the third in our eTeaching.org lecture on e-learning research. And it deals with a topic which is currently buzzing on the news when it comes to e-learning in higher education. I'm, of course, talking about the MOOCs, the massively open online courses where students from all around the globe gather to network and learn together, um, supported by university teachers who often stand also in the spotlight and offer their expertise, or maybe not stand in the spotlight. That is to debate. And as it's such a fresh topic, um, we only have a few studies examining the implications of MOOCs for learning, for the domain of higher education, and for our culture in a broader sense. Questions of interest here are especially how can MOOCs be designed in order to foster learning, but also before that, how do we practice research on MOOCs? Which methods and theoretical conception are appropriate for MOOC research? So who could be better suited to address those questions than the learning researcher and one of the inventors of the first ever MOOC in 2008, Mr. Stephen Downs. Stephen Downs is a senior researcher at the Canadian National Research Council and is known as an international expert around e-learning and especially connected learning. His key areas are online learning, new media, pedagogy, and philosophy. On his website, website Downs, .ca. He publishes talks and articles since 1995. And the online newsletter OL Daily has thousands of readers all around the world. So welcome, Stephen. Thanks for being here with us for the talk. Before we start, I have a few uh, remarks on organizational issues. Stephen Downs is going to present roughly 30 to 40 minutes. Then we have 20 minutes of discussion time. Of course, you can ask questions already during the talk. Um, we are going to collect those questions and discuss them afterwards. And I will only interrupt the talk if uh, it is absolutely necessary for understanding. OK, um, and I heard also from Stephen, he will watch the chat a bit and see if he can react on what is happening. All right, um, I guess now we're ready to start. Um, I'm going to switch to your presentation slides now, Stephen. So, stage is yours. Sorry about that. So, you're ready for me? Yes, we're ready, if you are. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank all of you for coming on what is turning out to be a beautiful day, at least here in Tübingen. Uh, this is my first time in to begin. My first time actually in southern Germany. I've been, visited the northern part of the country in Berlin, but I've never been in the hilly part here in the south. And I'm learning that to begin is a city filled with stairs. And you go up and you go down, you go up and you go down, and that's life in to begin. Now, I've already had my first complaint about my slides. So, um, and the complaint was that the slides don't address the topic of MOOCs directly. But that said, uh, I'm going to be thinking about MOOCs and probably talking about MOOCs. And the context of this discussion is MOOCs. But, but it's important to keep in mind that you know, as, as I tell other people, you know, I'm more than just MOOCs. I sing, I dance, I act, and I want to direct. Uh, I'm just kidding. But, but I mean, if, if we're thinking just in terms of MOOC research methodologies, I think we're probably making a bit of a mistake. And the other thing I want to say at the outset, too, is that the MOOC is certainly as developed by George and myself, George Siemens and myself, is the result of the methodology or the lack of methodology that I'll talk about. And I think that's true of most of the interesting developments that have happened on the World Wide Web, not just the MOOC, but 
many of the interesting uh, sites and services that they're not the result of some carefully constructed research plan but that they happen if you will serendipitously and I think understanding that aspect of reality is important to moving forward not just in this discipline but in the sciences generally uh, the title here I've got is Digital Research Methodologies Redux because these are basically slides from a presentation I did not too long ago called Against Digital Research Methodologies. And so this flavor, this flavor that is characteristic of the courses that we offer is also characteristic of the research that at least I do about the courses. But for those of you who want actual real live MOOC research, I do recommend you look up people like Rita Kopp, Helen Fournier, uh, Francis Bell, uh, Jenny McNess, uh, where's the Y? German keyboards, uh, Roy Williams. Uh, John Mack, and and that that will get you started. These are people who have done more traditional work, more traditional research in MOOCs, and and me, my perspective is, you know, I gather the statistics and ship them out, and it's just data that passes in front of me. But that said, with that preamble. And we've lost all of our attendees. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's funny because the list of attendees box shrank on me. Uh, okay, and my slides won't advance. Why not? Oh, okay. So, what this is is not a prescription for how you should research MOOCs, although you might. Uh, this is a report. I'm describing or explaining the sort of approach to research that I've taken that have led me to develop MOOCs and led me to do the sort of work that I've done. It's definitely not for everybody, but I think that some people should work this way. All right, so let's review stuff that you've been taught, probably about how to do good research. And I was just at a conference here, I'm still at this conference, on mass collaboration. And most of the papers followed this method. I think they all followed this method except mine. And the paper began with a research question of some sort. And there was much thought put to framing these questions. Then they did the background research, also known as the literature search or literature review, constructed a hypothesis to be tested. Then they would test the hypothesis, usually on Wikipedia, because that's a good, easy place to test hypotheses. They have nice, neat data sets. Then the data would be analyzed, and the communication would be drawn, and the results would be communicated. And you totally don't need me to tell you about this methodology for doing research because you've probably been told it many times. So this is pretty much the core to most typical research methods that you'll encounter, um, you know, both uh, in the development of new technologies and also in the examination of the impacts of existing technologies. Design research, observational research, qualitative research, grounded theory, all of these are based roughly pretty much on the same sort of model. And indeed, there are journals, numerous journals, that won't accept papers unless they're in this kind of model. I know this. It's known as the hypothetical deductive method uh, originally. And then it was updated by Carl Hempel, who was a logical positivist of the purest sort in the middle of the 20th century as the deductive nominological method, sometimes known as inference to the best explanation, sometimes known under the generic term of abduction. 
and of course the idea is right you you're observing your phenomena you're looking at your phenomena you're asking a question about the phenomena and then you're gonna hypothesize is that a word hypothesize an explanation for that and sometimes that will involve the hypothesization of unknown mysterious entities the most famous of which of course was the hypothetical existence of mass and mass explains so much and mass is what makes Newton's theories all work so Newton asks what is the apple fall comes up with this concept of mass mass explains everything the problem is now our ontology especially in the field of educational technology and pedagogy generally is filled with these hypothetical entities that are used as explanations now I'm an empiricist uh, for me observation and experience are the foundation for knowledge I think that's really important there is no to my mind synthetic a priori that is to say there is no truth that can be known before experience just by thinking about it and this applies additionally to digital research methods and I don't see reason itself as the way of getting at the truth of things I think that the way of getting at the truth of things if there is a truth of things and I don't even presume that is through observation and experience. Did I just turn something off here? Oh, it's a little phone thing. Audio still on? Yep. I hope it's still okay. There we go. I think I've undone whatever I did. So, and and why why do I take this perspective? Now, this when I originally did this presentation. I had a slide on David Hume. David Hume is a skeptic, and, and what he says is that our generalizations about the world, our theories as it were, are things that we just habitually come to believe through experience, and they're not based on any fundamental or underlying principle. And so that makes him a skeptic, right? And the classic argument against the skeptic is well you have to believe some things uh, you know you have to believe that the ground is solid otherwise you couldn't even walk right and I'm the kind of person who always expects the ground to open up in front of them um, and it was before I gave this talk last year there was this string of videos that came online of people falling into holes when the ground opened up beneath them just to make my point you know we, we think we have these theories we think these theories are universally applicable the other ones aren't available oh I'm sorry about that you can't trust YouTube at all <laughs> and actually I found lots of videos aren't available here in Germany that are available in Canada but trust me all three of these are videos of people falling into holes and actually if you do, if you search you'll find that there are numerous pictures of people who are just walking along and the ground opens up and swallows them it's the strangest thing so I'm really skeptical about the existence of universal theories but more um, the, the whole concept that we can just infer to a theory from data is based on what Willard von Norman Quine called two dogmas of empiricism first dogma is that there is a distinction to be drawn between analytic and synthetic propositions that is there's a distinction to be drawn between fact and theory that there's a distinction to be drawn between your observations and the hypotheses that you're going to draw from them and this distinction when you push it a little bit turns out to be very false uh, you know, Laden much later would come along and talk about theory laden data and the point that Quine is making is even the simplest observation statement this is a red thing uh, comes loaded already with theory so there is, there is no 
there, there, there is no analytic synthetic distinction. There is no distinction between observation and theory. And the second dogma of empiricism is that reductionism is true. And this was the topic in our mass collaboration workshop a little bit. This presumption on the part of researchers, they're looking at mass collaboration generally, including MOOCs, including Wikipedia, including other online environments. And they're, they're asking, for example, um, what is, you know, is there a consensus of concepts? And uh, there was a paper that was given today. I, I've forgotten the author, I'm afraid, but maybe it's still in my notes here. Uh, yeah, it will, it will be. Uh, not... Darren, the person after Darren, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Uh, Thomas Herman, I think. No, 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 it was. Yeah, 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 it was. It was Darren Gurgle. And he did a talk on understanding and bridging the Wikipedia language gap. And what he looked at was the formation of concepts as instantiated by Wikipedia pages in different languages. And interestingly, he found that these concepts don't line up neatly one to one. That in one language, you'll have one set of concepts. In another language, you'll have another set of concepts. And that among two or three languages, the best you'll get is about a 40% overlap. And of the 25 languages they studied, the overlap of all 25 was less than 1%. So does that mean that 24 of the languages got it wrong and only one is getting it right? Or does it mean that there is no one way, one right way of describing the world? And I fall into that category. I don't think there is a single way of describing the world. You know, and this is what happens when, when we take these phenomena like a MOOC or Wikipedia or anything and we try to analyze it and find out what the conceptual structure is that it represents, there is no conceptual structure that it represents. We're presuming that it represents a conceptual structure and that that structure is somehow true before we even get to the analysis. So when I look at a phenomenon like a MOOC, when I look at a phenomenon like Wikipedia, I don't think I can even state what a theory would look like of one of these things, much less find such a theory. So I'm kind of a skeptic about the possibility of doing research on MOOCs. And I know you didn't sign up for that when you signed up for this presentation. But that's where my own work has led me, and I'm going to tell you where it's led me. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be being useful. So, essentially, we're looking here at what might be called the fallacy of theory. There's, and there are different aspects to it. But again, I want I want you to question. When you read theories about MOOCs, when you read theories about Wikipedia, communication, online learning, ask these kind of questions. Uh, first of all, what distinguishes sense from nonsense in the theory that you're looking at? And, and even more importantly, what distinguishes the theory that you're looking at from nonsense? Um, you know, and, and if you look at it, from a really hard skeptical perspective, it becomes very difficult to make that distinction. Take construct, uh, constructivism, for example. Uh, the, the idea that people are making meaning. Right? What distinguishes that concept from nonsense? If there isn't a good answer, and there probably isn't, then there's this sense where the theory looks like it's pursuing some, some kind of truth, but it's really sort of moving you around in circles. Uh, second, theory-laden data, which I mentioned. How much of the theory is already embedded in the data that you're studying? People are studying MOOCs. Uh, 
one of the first things they studied was dropout rates. Why did they study dropout rates? Because they assumed that a MOOC was the same kind of thing as a regular course. And since you study dropout rates in regular courses, you study dropout rates in MOOCs. But think about what's happening here. You have the presumption going in that dropout rates are somehow relevant to the study of MOOCs. What made you think that? You're finding what you were looking for, but you're finding it only because you already expected to see it. Third thing, and related, incommensurability in paradigms. I have a lot of difficulty with this. I see the world, and I've tried to explain it in terms of connectivism, connective knowledge, and that sort of thing, and I see the world, and I see the world of learning very differently than people who are working in this traditional conception, working in the traditional hypothetical deductive, deductive nominological model, people who are working in the traditional do an experiment, write up a journal article kind of model. I see the world very differently. And, and I see the world as, as a tapestry, as chaos, as patterns that never repeat, and, and so on. It's really difficult to explain. And when we're getting into the realm of theory, it's actually not possible for somebody working in one theory to describe another theory, because the terms are different. There is not an overlap of terms is like working in two separate languages, right? Just like the language differential on Wikipedia. You're talking, I don't know, Armenian, and I'm talking Georgian, and I assume they're different. <laughs> uh, and, and our vocabulary overlaps a little bit, and it gives us this illusion of communication, but we're not really communicating. And then the fourth thing is, empty consensus replacing rationality and truth. There's this idea that if everybody thinks it's true, it's probably true, which I think we all, you know, in a certain intuitive sense, we all agree that, no, this isn't the case. But nonetheless, we see more and more what counts as good scientific inquiry being defined as that which resembles what was previously counted as good scientific inquiry. So to my mind, research methods, including the mechanism for researching MOOCs in a certain sense, and in most senses, presuppose their own conclusions. Most of the time, people who are researching MOOCs find the conclusion they were trying to prove. They ask a question knowing they're going to find an answer. Are MOOCs bad? Why, yes, it turns out MOOCs are bad. Do MOOCs have high dropout rates? Why, yes, they have high dropout rates, according to my definition of high, um, and so on. There's the, the, argument, um, the argument that uh, MOOCs and similar technology do not increase access to people in the developing world. Why? Because most of the people who take MOOCs are from the developed world and already actually have university degrees and all of that. Well, yes, that's true, and any study that's looking for that will find that result. But there's 200,000 people taking a MOOC. It doesn't matter if most of them are from the developed world. 5,000 of them are from the developing world. And of those 5,000, for 4,000 of them, they had no other opportunity before the MOOC. You know, you, you look at the same numbers, and on the one hand, it looks like we're just ignoring the developing world. And on the other hand, it looks like we're increasing access to the developing world fivefold. Which number is correct? Well, they're both correct. You find what you're looking for. Uh, the research methods are silent on, I think, the really interesting, complex questions, uh, whether certain software ought to be developed. Should we be developing more closed systems? Should we be developing digital rights systems? Should we be developing surveillance technologies? Uh, is that the right thing to develop? What kind of research is going to answer that question? Uh, what options should users be given? What subjects ought users or learners be taught to learn? Research really is quiet on this, unless we've already presupposed what subjects, for example, we think they ought to be taught. So 
like I say, I'm against research method. I explicitly draw from Paul Feyerman, who's against method in general. He's what he calls an epistemological anarchist. And he reaches the conclusion that there are no useful and exceptionalist methodological rules governing the progress of science or the growth of knowledge. It's a complex phenomenon. It would be like trying to come up with rules for surfing on very large waves. There are no rules for surfing on very large waves. There might be general principles like don't fall into the water, but you'll find even that these general principles are useful only after you've mastered the art of surfing on very large waves. And so really, you know, Fire Robin's method is anything goes. A lot of people just say, you know, whatever works. But even that presupposes a methodology, presupposes some statement of what works. Uh, John Ralston Saul, who's a uh, Canadian epistemologist, epistemologist, writes that while Voltaire thought that reason was the best defense against arbitrary political and religious authority, and he was right in that, our use of reason over the last two, three hundred years has led to the belief that reason solves all of our problems. And in fact, it's the reverse, says Saul. Most of our problems are due to the misapplication of reason. That's not to say reason is a bad thing. It's just reason doesn't lead us to the promised land. It just keeps us out of the swamps. Uh, that's a metaphor. Oops. So, how did I go about developing moats? What sort of approach did I take? Indeed, what sort of approach did George take? Uh, first of all, in the design of this, it quite literally was not based on research. Uh, I didn't go out and do a bunch of studies and then conclude, oh, the way to respond to this problem was to build a MOOC. Um, and I didn't because I've seen very consistently over the years in educational technology that when people do this, the phenomenon they observe is exactly the sort of thing that they were planning to build anyways. And so who has the time for that? Um, or the money for that. It's, you know, working mostly without funding here, so uh, there's no point having a research study which will prove that there's a need for this thing I already thought there was a need for. Better to simply start tinkering and see if it works. Uh, another thing, though, is this ho this whole I and thou aspect of research. Once you start thinking of the research that you're doing as collecting data, collecting observations from a world out there. And the people we're working with aren't the world out there. Um, you know, they're, they're not in any sense fundamentally distinct from me. I mean, they're, they're distinct from me in that they're separate entities. But it's not like I have a unique and privileged point of view. Even if I have an education and all of that, I don't have a unique and privileged point of view of what they must need. So I don't want to um, explorative slash scrum. Uh, an interesting, although opaque, con uh, comment. <laughs> um, Scrum is one of those words that could mean anything. Well, not literally anything. It doesn't mean cheese doodle, but you know what I mean. Uh, so I didn't. I don't like that separate I and thou. And in our development of MOOCs with George, with Dave Cormier, and with all the rest, it's always been this case of us as this gang of miscreants trying to do something, right? And George and I set up the MOOC, but it isn't as though we're teaching a MOOC. It's more like we're having a MOOC, and that's something very different. And so similarly on the research dimension, it's not we're studying them, but rather we're all going for this experience together. Do you see the distinction? 
it's hard to make this distinction if we're working from incommensurable paradigms. And, and so sometimes I linger on it. There's this idea of research-led design, and, and this exists, you know, well, pretty much in every in in every domain, and, and also in educational technology. And you know, we I can't tell you how many papers I've I've read about you know research-based instructional design, research-based instructional theory. Um, and and I, I I get that, and I see why they do that. But the flip side of it is design-based or design-led research, where you do the design first. So here's our, oh, this didn't come out well. Is it being, oh, OK. So here's the, the overall framework of design-led research and research-led design, so design-led research is at the top, research-led is at the bottom, the expert mindset and the participatory mindset. So this is kind of an abstract, very arbitrary representation of the concept that I've just been talking about. So in that framework, we can identify different trends in, the, in, in research, so the design-led research we have critical design, design plus emotion, etc. at the top, where at the bottom we have things like applied ethnography, human factors, etc. The kind of research that especially computer designers, uh, software designers will be familiar with at the bottom. On the right hand side we have the participatory design methodologies. But in educational technology, mostly, almost entirely, what we have are the expert mindsets. So where you'll find me mostly is in the design-led participatory mindset up at the top. So I'm thinking of designing with video, designing games, uh, design probes where you just try something. You, you, you know, I, I've done that so many times. And if you read through my newsletter over the last dozen years, every once in a while you'll see, you know, I built this thing. Uh, it inserts RSS feeds into chat rooms. What do you think of that? That one that I just described, complete and total failure. My, my career is littered with these complete and total failures. And, and what happens is, and I, you know, again, I just, I have this idea. I'll build a system that puts RSS feeds into chats. Why? I don't know. It might work, might not, but it won't take me a long time to do. It's what Terry Anderson called, you know, the, the quick and low cost failure. Do it, put it out there, see what happens. Yeah, total failure. I don't know why people didn't like that. I would think it would be interesting. You have a chat and every once in a while the chat room will insert a resource. And then you talk about it. That just didn't fall. So sometimes they talk about situated make tools where they situate the study in the workplace, ground the design in the workers' explanations of what they're doing. Again, this is the same sort of thing where you're, you're trying to find this environment. You're trying to just mess around with this environment and see what happens. Uh, you use temporary, low-cost, cheap things, and you're not worried so much about you know pulling data, improving theories. You're just seeing what happens. And I know there's, for some people, there, there might not be a distinction between the two, but I really do think there's a distinction between the two. It's kind of the distinction between counting the geese in the sky and noticing that they make a big V-shaped pattern. Right? You're not going to probably design a research study where you look at what's the pattern the geese are going to make because it won't even occur to you ahead of time that there will be a pattern. But when you look at the geese, you see the V, you go, oh, there's a V. Um, but if you're focused on your research design, all you'll be doing is counting geese and you'll never see the pattern. Situating is framing. Situating is in a certain sense, theorizing, but narrowing down your, your theory. So 
what is it to go beyond theory in research? The picture there is actually a picture in my office. It is the picture in my office. It's, uh, for those of you who have been to um, Lisbon, it's the Age of Discovery monument that they have on the shores of the Tagus River. And of course, this monument is right at the last point where the ships leaving the harbor would see Lisbon as they went to discover the, uh, the coast of Africa and India and points beyond. So you have Prince Henry the Navigator and you have Bartholomew Diaz and Vasco da Gama and all of those other really cool guys that I studied when I was in school. And design without theory is, to my mind, discovery. And that picture symbolizes what I think I'm doing when I'm doing things like building MOOCs or inserting stuff into Wikipedia to get editors to complain or whatever I do. Um, and I know that I'm only seeing a very small part of the landscape and that I'm contributing only a very small part of the map. But the main point is I know it's a map, right? So I'm not going to take my little bit of the landscape and say everything else is like this because that would be absurd. You know, there is no generalization of what a map of the world looks like. Europe, Europe, North America, North America, and so on. I don't theorize about the world. I, I often talk about reading the world. Um, I don't see the world as neat and organized with logic, math, and theory. I see it as horribly messy, horribly complex, always changing like a language. And so, you know, if, if I predict the future, if I explain the past, I'm not depending on generalizations or theories. It's more like I'm reading the signs and, and the signs tell me what happened. You might think of this method as a form of literacy. You might think of my research methodology as I'm reading the environment that I'm working in. I, I immerse myself, like I immerse myself in French, or if I was studying German, which I'm not, by the way, I'm sorry. Um, but if I was studying German, I would immerse myself in German and try to live in a German city for a number of years or whatever. And that's how I would learn the language. And I might use some general principles and things, but you know, I have learned languages, and they turn out these general principles are almost always false. You know, as general principles. At best, they're rough, off-the-cuff abstractions. But, you, but people can learn languages, and they can learn languages not by forming theories about them and generalizing them, but, but, getting, but by getting messy and getting into the language and playing with it. So, and so theorizing, forget theorizing, research is like literacy. Research is like reading the world. And that's, that's how I think of MOOCs. MOOCs is me reading the world of online learning. And, and me trying to, if you will, trying to speak online learning with other people who are involved in online learning. I often tell people, I write through my software. And it's true. I, I, I don't write software in order to create great software because I certainly don't, but I create software in order to express myself. So what are the aspects of this literacy? This literacy is beyond simple grammar, rules, things like that, because we know language is much more complex than that. My own frame for literacy divides it into six areas. These are rough and ready. This is not the structure of literacy. It's not a theory about literacy. It's just a way of talking about it. So what are the sorts of things uh, that I'm working with, you know, but it makes learning languages more efficient? You know, Alan, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. Um, if I tried to learn a language first by learning all of these things in the abstract and then applying them to a language, I think I would have a terrible time learning the language. 
But if I learn the language by learning the language and then after the fact is kind of a rationalization, maybe stating what I've learned, uh, I think that might work better. But, you know, at least it works for me. It goes together. And, and maybe it does. Um, it's interesting. I was going to say, well, it's the sort of thing we can study empirically, but it's probably different for every person. It manifests itself differently for every person. I think it would be a horrible thing to try to generalize. So what are the ways we read? Well, we, we are pattern recognizers, um, not theorizers. Theorization is at best a very highly specific artificial form of pattern recognition. You know, uh, but there are all kinds of patterns that we can recognize because that's pretty much what our brains do. Everything from archetypes to ideals to grammars to procedures to skills to regularities, similarities, substitutivity. Uh, if you ever get a chance, look up uh, eggcorns. Philip says, what about studying Latin empirically? Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting thought, isn't it? I wonder how well people who study Latin in contemporary times actually understand Latin. And my suspicion is if you take someone who learned Latin today using all the best mechanisms to learn Latin and then put them in Rome in, I don't know, 100 BC, they probably could not be understood and could not understand. That would be my guess. Um, because there's just we think languages is made of rules, but in application and practice, it's so much not made of rules. Uh, Chomsky, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Um, semantics is another side. Um, <coughs> there's a lot that's said about semantics. We have this tendency of applying things like truth, meaning, purpose, goals, objectives, interpretations, associations, etc., to things. And there's two aspects to that. First of all, to recognize that we can do it. And the, a lot of what we see in the world is the result of the imposition of semantics, the imposition of meaning. But second, to realize that this is Again, something that we have put over and above the phenomena and not necessarily, probably not at all, inherent to the phenomena. There's a lot of speculation, for example, in MOOCs about what people taking MOOCs want to do. And and, and we, we look at all of their actions and we assume there must be some sense of goal or purpose to what these 100,000 people are doing. But in fact, there may not be a sense of goal or purpose. We presume they're all trying to complete the course, complete, excuse me, complete the course. Well, some of them are, some of them aren't. Some of them think of complete the course in one way, some of them think of complete the course in another way. A lot of the time, especially when we're looking at mass complex things, our ascription of a semantics is purely an interpretation of an emergent phenomenon and not the identification of something that's essentially or fundamentally true. Pragmatics, the use of things, the actions, the impacts of things, another aspect of understanding, and one that very often goes beyond the realm of theory. Cognition, the way what we're looking at thinks, reasons, decides, runs away. Um, which may apply to natural and non-natural things. The context, everything is different in different contexts. The, the normal trappings of theorization and explanation that we think are rock solid are very context dependent. You look at explanation, for example, which has been studied by a large number of philosophers. We say that, and remember off the top of this presentation, right? The point of a theory is to explain. Well, what is it to explain? Van Frassen says, to explain is to answer a why question. Okay, well, that's good enough, but what is the answer to a why question? Well, it's an answer that's framed with reference to why not. Why this? Well, why not that? When you ask why something happened, it's from the perspective of 
why something else didn't happen instead. Why are there roses growing beside the house? Right? You might be asking that as opposed to why is there anything growing at all? Or you might be asking it, why are there roses instead of tulips? Or, or you, you might be asking, well, there's all kinds of ways you can start to begin to frame that. Hansen talks about what is the cause of an accident? Well, it was the driver. It was a defect in the car. It was the location of a bush. But all of these things are context sensitive, meaning, tense, vocabulary, ontologies, logical space, uh, frames, worldviews. These are all context dependent. And so seeing the relation between context and whatever you're studying is important to understanding it. Understanding how things change, understanding flow, progression, different ways of changing, different kinds of changing, different paces of change. All of these are important as well. So if you take that overall view of literacy, and you think of that as your approach to research and design, then you get a very different picture from the standard picture, the ones that your academic journals still insist that you follow of, of you know, forming a question, doing a hypothesis, observing some phenomena, trying to explain. It, it now becomes, you know, if you will, a dance with the phenomena that you're looking at. You're getting into it, engaging with it, messing around with it, uh, you know, doing things that the, the skills described by Jenkins, performance, simulation, appropriation. All of these are things that you can do with phenomena, but these things are kinds of languages. And so it's chaotic, it's messy, but it's productive. You don't learn a language, you discover it, you find it, uh, you uncover meanings and, and hidden associations in it. You do that become, by becoming immersing in it, not just to the language, but to the society. And my method in building MOOCs and studying MOOCs is basically, I go to the office each day and I do stuff like this. Right, and I get involved in this discussion, even though some guy's going to complain about the slides, and I try to interact and understand. And now I'll get all of your reactions, and we'll see how it worked. Maybe it was on target, and maybe it wasn't. I didn't have expectations going into this. I'm not trying out a theory. I'm just interacting and seeing how it goes. And I'm doing it from my perspective my limited perspective as an explorer and I'm just trying to find my way. That's all I'm trying to do and that's all anyone who is in research is trying to do. And if there is a theory, it's not something I'm going to discover in my head and propagate to all of you. It's going to be something that we all discover together. People talk about, you know, Newton discovered gravity, Einstein discovered relativity, and all of the rest. I think that's a wrong interpretation. The theory emerges from the totality of the work, and there is a totality of the work. This picture here, the disunity of the sciences, is the mess that our theorizing is, but it's also the map of a MOOC. Uh, thank you, and I'm more than willing to take any comments or any questions. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thanks very much for your interesting uh, talk. Um, we didn't have too many questions uh, in the chat until no, now. They were very quiet in the chat. <laughs> and if there were, you already answered uh, some of those. Um, yeah, you have to, uh, to our um, viewers, do you have the chance to ask questions now? <coughs> we have about 10 more minutes to um, do some discussion. Ah, that's and, better. Yeah, now we can see the questions better. Um, yes, just I a few like remarks. Your talk. Thank you. Um, maybe, maybe I ask a question until we have one from the um, audience or the participants. Um, isn't connectivism as you sometimes propose it 
a theory or would you would you say it is a theory that um, explains underlying principles in MOOCs? A lot of people want it to be. Um, I've very explicitly stated in the past that I don't care whether people call it a theory. Uh, I've also written a little post recently that interprets connectivism as a theory in order to respond to some of those questions. I don't think it's a theory in the sense that I don't think it posits universal generalizations that explain everything. Uh, and I think a lot of the ways it's really an interpretation or a way of seeing the world rather than a description of underlying properties of the world. And as such, um, it, it's not held to any particular sort of structure or, or purpose. Um, you know, there, there are no rules about how to see the world. We, we sometimes pretend that there are. But the pretense that there are is only based on the understanding that these things are actually getting to the truth of the matter. And I think the truth of the matter is where we begin with our experiences and our observations. And the more we get away from them, the more we're getting away from truth and into the realm of abstraction and interpretation and the rest. So we're not getting closer to the truth, we're getting further from it. And sometimes it's useful to get further away from the truth. Um, and, 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 you know, it gives you this, you know, this remote detached perspective and that, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's like being able to see the landscape from three, 30,000 feet. Sometimes it's helpful, but it's not true. And, and, you know, theories, you know, the, the typical thing, right? You use a theory to make a prediction that tests whether the theory is true or confirmed. But I don't, I just don't see it that way. Okay. We have several questions now from users. Um, Anna is asking, so is it more about current construction than understanding? Yeah, I, I like that question. Uh, and it's interesting because Van Frassen, who I cited, his philosophy is known as constructive empiricism. And there is a strong streak of, of that in my thinking. Uh, you know, I was influenced by the post-positivists. So by people like Van Frass and by people like Nelson Goodman uh, and others. But I would be hesitant to characterize it as construction because construction implies intent. And I think most of this kind of learning is non-intentional. I think it's a way that we grow into the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, so learning just as an aside, is basically a matter of putting yourself in a situation where you will grow into it in useful ways. But, and, and it's important to understand that it is a process of growing because that tells us that it's much less under our direct control than we might think. Uh, and, and that it's, it's the sort of thing that is aided by the things that might typically aid growing. So, you know, the sort of things that you might associate with growing, say, muscles, like exercise, good nutrition, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. There also was a bit of a discussion now going on whether um, it is, uh, Valentin D asked that, whether it is, um, if you want to dismiss research in gen general, um, and Sabina, Siemens was answering um, that um, there's just a change in focus yeah. in research. How would you respond to that? I, I would love to take the entire journal system and scrap it and start over. Um, the, the bulk of what I read in journals I do not find useful. And I don't find it useful precisely because of the criticisms that I've made in this talk. Uh, you know, I, I think 
that a lot of this research is very inventive and creative, but it's put within this mantle and this structure of uh, adding to this global consensus view or understanding of the nature of learning psychology or whatever, and there just isn't one and there isn't going to be one. Again, it's like you know, trying to find the global consensus view of the surface features of a wave. Um, you know, some beyond some very broad strokes, which we already know, uh, you know, teaching is modeling and demonstrating, learning is practice and reflection. Beyond those very broad strokes, every individual wave is different. Every individual person is different. And so it becomes much more a matter of trying different things and seeing, well, just trying different things and even seeing what works is a bit of a misnomer. I'd like to, you know, in, in a sense, it's a refocusing. Um, if researchers built more and studied less, I would be happier. I think I'd be more interested in reading what they wrote. Um, if they were less detached and pseudo-objective, I'd be more interested in what they wrote. Um, if they moved you know, beyond counting, even beyond quantification, and actually looked at what presumptions of meaning, reference, objective, and value informs the work that they're doing. I think that would be important. Uh, so and I see Nicole saying, so like try and error and learn from it. And, and yeah, and it's really not more complex than that. And, you know, I wish the research journals would report the errors. You know, I went to do a study, but I made this really stupid methodological mistake in the first week, and I wasted a year of my life. We never see those. Um, you know, I mean, uh, and, and it's because of this, pres well, it's because of this presumption. It's, it's because of a whole variety of factors, and there is no single explanation, and it's a mistake. You see how I want to do it? I want to explain everything, right? It's because of this. It's because of that. But it isn't. There's just this general generic phenomenon that I don't like, and I'm reacting against, and I try to theorize about it. If I could only explain it, then I could stop it. But, you know, except for, you know, very simple physical systems, generally that just doesn't work. Okay. Um, we have one last question, maybe, from um, Salatine. Um, or maybe it's already yeah. answered, she says. Thank you. Um, it, it's again pointing out um, other methodologies like action research, ethnography, grounded theory, which might be more suitable to getting those discovering, those exploring into research. Um, yeah, but, you know, again, I mean, we can say, you, you know, you, you know, I come in here and I do a talk. and I could talk for 40 hours and at the end of it, can, someone could say, well, you didn't consider such and such a theory, right? Have you considered that, right? That's and that's ninety nine percent of academic writing is oh you didn't you know it's coming up with, you know we've got a proliferation of these theories a proliferation of these methodologies uh, you know it's like complaining to someone he says I'm not religious you know well did you look at bilateral non orthodox East Lithuanian Catholicism. Well, no, I didn't. I, you know, I'm, I realize I shouldn't be comparing that to uh, to uh, ethnography or grounded theory, but from my perspective, you know, we're we're getting into you know subdenominations of the same faith, right? And the problem is with the faith. The problem is with the presumption that there's a methodology that's going to get us somewhere. On the right day, I am a left-handed, right-brained uh, Lithuanian evangelist, but only on the right day. Other days, um, I'm, a, I'm a Ukrainian potter, utilitarian, Unitarian. Other days, I'm you know a backward, left-slanted Hindu. Uh, you know, 
and there's no reason for it. There isn't an explanation for it. It's just on that day, that's the religion I want to have. And, you know, you might say, well, you should be a Muslim when you go into a mosque. Well, sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. You know, there's this presumption that some theory has to be the way you're looking at the world or the way you're conducting your research. I could be halfway through an, an ethnographic study and think, you know, ethnography is really silly, um, and and move to something different, you know, and and that's the approach I'm trying to get at here. It's not, you know, none of them are right. A pox on your houses. It's that they're all a little right. They're all a little wrong, and the supposition that there's a rationality for choosing one over the other is itself mistaken. Nicole, but we can learn from the others, from the errors of others, right? Yes, there was uh, some discussion going on whether yeah. reporting, there should be a culture of reporting errors yeah. or um, honoring yeah. the reporting of errors in, in science. Yeah. Yeah, and but it's funny how the discussion went, right? We went from reporting errors to, well, there should be a reason to report errors, right? We can learn from them. That's why we should report errors. And my, my take is, no, we should just report errors because that's what happened, right? And and not worry about the reason for it. Okay. I'm afraid we're a bit short in time now, so um, the remaining questions um, have to go into our forum maybe, or maybe on Twitter. Maybe you want to send an email to Stephen to um, address those questions. Free. Okay. Great. Um, so. Yeah, I'm afraid I have to close discussion now. Um, again, Stephen, thank you very much for being here with us and for your remarks and your very interesting talk. For everyone's information, um, a recording of the talk will be online on eTeaching.org within the next few hours. Also, thank you to all participants here today for watching and engaging in discussion. You are invited to continue discussion on our social media channel on Twitter um, or in the forum in our community section. I would also like to invite you to our next event. I have the slide here in the lobby, I guess. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, anyways, uh, there's a there will be a talk um, on Monday the 6th of June at 2 p.m. or 14 o'clock German time. Um, this is going to be again in German language as usual for our talks. And um, we will have um, Birgit Spies from Think Time Learning Solutions um, and Thomas Bernhardt from the University of Bremen talking about um, research on social media um, in higher education teaching and um, research on learning 2.0. Um, and that one will focus more on comparing um, results, maybe, that have come out of previous studies in the last few years. And um, also um, seeing if there are differences in the culture of taking MOOCs, uh, not MOOCs, but um, using social media and teaching in the United States or in Europe, um, or if it's basically the same. Uh, there, see, there's a slide, this is a slide now. So you're very invited to uh, participate again on the 16th of June for today. Thanks a lot to everyone involved. Have a good weekend and see you next time.